when you think about a conference, uh, you can draw some parallels to what a conference is versus our sort of daily work that we do. Uh, in some ways, a conference is kind of our Olympics, or it's kind of our space launch or our Grand Prix, and I guess we all kind of just win by being here together. I mean, it's not every day that you get to launch rockets, uh, but I think that this is, this is one of those such occasions, and I think we should enjoy being here together, especially at the first CSS Conf here in Asia, which I think is fucking incredible, because Singapore is amazing, and uh, I, I'm really, really happy to be here as well. Today my talk is not, uh, it's not about code, it's about being a coder, I guess, or a designer. Um, I'm asking the question, what are we doing anyway? And I talked about the space launch as if that was something that we aren't sort of really doing. Um, you know, we're often, like, this is our environment. We sit looking at a terminal with a blinking cursor and we're typing in there all day. Or maybe uh, we're hitting reload all day and swearing at a browser and looking at the box model. Um, and I think what's really kind of interesting, uh, when you think about what it is that we do, uh, we, you know, I mean, before the web was this intangible thing, you know, when we had big CRT monitors that sat on the back of our desks, uh, you know, it, like, we, we had no connection to, uh, to the web. But what's really interesting about now is that we're just surrounding ourselves in those screens, and they're just smaller. They're in our pockets, and they're in our bags, and they're in our tiny laptops. And so we don't have tangibility over our work, really, but it's just closer. So we tell ourselves that it's okay and that we're actually building something physical. But we're not. Anyway, I'll introduce myself super quickly. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I'd say that I was a designer, but uh, I would be lying. I didn't go to design school. I did art in high school, and that was about my uh, sort of design background. I studied multimedia design. Um, I'd say I was a developer, but I didn't study computer science. Um, so I guess I would say that I was, uh, I just build things for the web. Um, I'm mostly self-taught, uh, like probably a lot of you are. Uh, I certainly didn't start doing stuff for the web because it was easy to describe to my parents. Uh, I just did it because I was working on a computer and I was really interested in how I created something. And I think that's probably true for, for a lot of you here. Um, how many people are self-taught? Like, a fair few. Okay, maybe, I don't know, 50%. Um, I, think, I think, you know, maybe uh, we get into doing what we're doing because we have this sort of dedication to a creative endeavor or we're just chasing a desire to learn how to do something. Also, oh, I forgot to mention. So I'm a contractor. I work for uh, sort of maybe four to six companies a year. Uh, I'm one of the three founding members of CSS Conf Australia. Uh, and uh, I just try to build stuff that I enjoy doing. And that's, that's what my talk today about, is about. Um, but the actual fact is that I have no idea what I'm doing. Today, I'm going to talk about fun and goofy, or fun slash goofy, over profit. So let's think about that for, for a second. What is fun and goofy? Fun's pretty self-explanatory, but what is goofy? Uh, goofy means like foolish or just harmlessly eccentric. And so I'm talking about the, the idea of building things just for the hell of it, just for like the sake of learning or just for having fun. So I would say I'm doing this, but I have no idea why. I just am. Brad Bouse at uh, Cascadia.js said, creative code is an experiment with the goal of surprising and delighting. Um, I think it's much easier to say that something's goofy, but that's just me. Uh, he also goes on to say that uh, when you do something that is uh, an experiment, uh, you do it because it might make you a better engineer. Uh, you don't necessarily need to quit your job, but you know, maybe you should just take a day off and try to build something. So I'm going to tell you a story. Can I bring the water? Maybe. Somebody's water. I'm going to drink it anyway. Tastes good. All right. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a couple of stories um, today. Uh, and they're just sort of points in, in my career over the last 13 years 
they're not like the best things I've ever worked on. Uh, they're not things that maybe made more money than other stuff that I've done. Um, but I think they're interesting for the sake of, they were really fun, but they were seriously goofy. Um, okay. One afternoon, uh, sometime in 2009, I was, uh, I was actually putting together a series of HTML5 workshops. This is when HTML5 was a new thing. We still called it HTML5 for, for one thing. And I, was, I went to a meetup and I said, hey, I think I'm going to maybe do some workshops. Uh, who would be interested in doing it? It's going to be a whole day. It'll be 300 bucks. Who wants to come? 70 people in the room put their hands up. And I sort of looked at the ground really nervously and I said, I'll get back to you. And two weeks later, I put a side up and I sold all of my tickets in like an hour. Suddenly I had like $15,000 in my bank account and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I had a date, I had a venue, but I still had no idea what I was doing. And I guess what I wanted to do was, I just wanted to know everything. I didn't want somebody to be able to say, well, what happens when it doesn't work in this browser? Or what happens in this situation? I didn't want to be wrong. So I started reading uh, W3C specs. And I just wanted to know, how does everything work? I'll just, I'll just read fucking everything, and nobody would be able to prove me wrong. And I started, and I quickly realized that W3C specifications are not built for normal people. They're built for people who build browsers. And so, I mean, I was going to get to the workshop eventually. I was eventually going to start preparing that. I mean, it was only in a week. And I had only you know, taken a lot of people's money by that point. And so I was madly researching. I took like time off work and I was just reading and researching and trying to develop this content. Um, but I stopped and I, I just did something as a little hack project one afternoon. Uh, I went into DevTools and I started messing around with the, the developer, uh, info, like the spec information. I started uh, changing margins and tweaking the typography and changing the line heights of everything, just trying to make everything more readable because I didn't really want what I was looking at. And I thought, hey, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll show it to a coworker and you know, maybe I'll make a little bookmark word out of this thing. And so I did, and I tap, you know, quickly, as fast as I could, in under an hour, uh, made this little bookmarklet that basically took the spec, added these weird styles that I decided were better than the other ones for whatever reason, uh, and I, I showed it to my friend Anthony, uh, pushed it's a GitHub, and a day or two later, I just tweeted like, oh, hey, here's some user styles. Um, good luck. That was it. I thought the project was over. And for the next three hours, I watched my phone explode in ways that I had never seen my phone explode. I had been working on open source for a long time, and I was kind of building things that I thought were interesting. I wasn't really getting that much attention, and this thing that I just kind of threw together when I was just messing about, you know, procrastinating essentially, suddenly it was making my phone melt on my desk. On the fourth hour, Paul Irish retweeted it. My phone exploded for the rest of the evening. And um, the next day, Paul got in touch and he actually sent me a, a pull request and the pull request was like, oh, hey, I fixed your fonts in Firefox because cross domain issues, it wasn't working, whatever. And I said, hey, cool, thanks, Paul. Um, merged it. I was like, oh my god, this guy actually knows who I am. This is super cool. Paul is one of my heroes. And uh, the next thing was I got an email from him saying, hey, what are you on Gchat? Suddenly, Paul messaged me and he's like, hey, what up? That was seriously the conversation. That was, I looked back through my message history. That was the message he sent me. Friendliest guy ever. And what was really interesting was that, like, like I said, this was something that I just threw out and I didn't think was important or interesting even. I was just doing it for the hell of it. But it wasn't just Paul. Other people kept coming out of the woodwork. Other people from organizations like W3C, and people like Steve Souders, and people who worked for browser companies were actually interested in the work that I was doing. People that I respected, <laughs> you know? It wasn't just dorks on the internet. These were like my heroes. A little while later, this is a great shot of me mid-speech. I look much younger, and, and, but still good looking, of course. Uh, so uh, this is my talk from Web Directions uh, 2010. Uh, so this was a little bit longer, and I was on this whole tip about how evil the W3C were. Uh, they are, so yeah, it's fine. Um, 
what was really fun that in, in between those few months of me throwing out this little bookmarklet and this point here was that Mike Smith from W3C got in touch. Uh, and I actually went to Tokyo for a conference or something else. And uh, Mike said, do you want to grab a beer? I was like, of course I want to grab a beer. Let's hang out. Let's, let's meet each other. Um, and what followed was really interesting. Uh, Mike had actually been working on a specification uh, that he called uh, HTML5 for authors. And the idea of HTML5 for authors was that he took the W3C spec, removed all of the crazy browser implementation crap, and uh, just shipped a much smaller version of the spec. It looked the same, but it was the content was slightly different, smaller. And we kept talking, and you know, we were, we were uh, you know, chatting a little bit. From the same talk, this is from you know the same the same moment in time. Uh, during this talk, uh, Mike and I had been working together, and uh, we actually took my my styles and pulled them out of the bookmarklet and fixed them and worked on it for a bit. And uh, you'll see, um, this is Mike here. And what we did during this talk was, he, I mean, he worked for W3C and he had access to deploy stuff. Uh, so we didn't ask anybody, but we just took the user styles and put them on his spec on the W3C site and hit deploy from the front row of my talk, which I thought was the coolest fucking thing in the world. And then I realized, holy shit, my work is running on their domain. I got pulled down, which you really want to know. But uh, it lasted a few weeks, but some people weren't so happy. It was, it was pretty amazing. A little bit later on, after a few months of nagging, Paul uh, Irish convinced me to start joining RC. He told me a few channels to join, and this conversation took place. I actually took this from the logs from 2010. Uh, so, Ian Hickson, oh my god, <laughs> where did we go, there it is, um, so Hixie up here was like, oh hey, uh, I thought this was really cool, the work that you did, uh, what do you say we put it on WhatWG? So we did. <laughs> we, uh, we shipped this uh, a month or so later, he just gave me access to deploy whatever I wanted and here we are. It's been online for five years now. Uh, it was the first W3C extended spec that, you know, obviously went WG, so it was kind of forked at that point, but that's a whole other story. Uh, it was offline capable, so you could go onto your tablet and it would sync down to your device, and it was just documentation, looked a little bit better. Whatever. That was cool. But I had no friggin' idea that when I sat there in 2009, writing a goofy little bookmarklet that I shared to one friend, that this would happen months later, that I'd be working with these people. So as an extension of my uh, talk, uh, I wanted to talk more about commercial versus fun and done. It's entirely possible that you here uh, will work you know, a full, busy, busy, lucrative career, doing good work for good people, uh, and your impact on the world will actually be minor. You're not gonna disrupt an industry. You're not gonna, you're not gonna fix anything. You're just gonna build good stuff for good people. And that's okay, that's totally fine. One of the frustrating things about our industry is that projects die. And when a project dies underneath you, you lose a little bit of yourself too. How many, show of hands, how many times have you lost something after three months of work? Not too many, six months, 12 months, like entire products disappearing, there's a couple of folks even good projects die. I worked on a few projects that died after uh, investing a lot of time and, and money into them and they disappeared from underneath me and I had no idea that they even kind of came or, or left. And I, now I guess, you know, I work for myself and I pay my own salary and I'm, I'm the person who maintains my own happiness. And I'm the person who has to pay my salary and my super and worry about when my next contract's coming in and if the contract's good and if I need to like yell at my client for some reason, which kind of sucks. Um, but I think it's really important that we focus for fun. So this is where we're going to start talking about fun. So 
this is a project that uh, started in my office. Uh, we were drinking beer. It was uh, 35 degrees, so it was kind of Singapore-ish. Um, we were in a, a warehouse office that had no air conditioning, so it was 35 degrees inside. We were you know, beading sweat down our heads, uh, and we'd all been doing client work for the day, and we were all kind of a little bit over it. In the office, we had just bought a projector. And so basically, we were projecting anything we could onto the wall. Uh, funnily enough, we started just projecting GIFs, because GIFs are awesome. Here are the people who were there. There's me eating a donut. Probably wasn't eating a donut right then. Uh, there's Glenn Madden. There's Tim Lucas. And there's uh, Josh. So this order. Um, myself, Glenn, and Tim are CSS Conf Australia, by the way. And Josh is just a rad friend that was sort of visiting the office that day. And we sat down and we started working on this thing called Gift City. I'm going to show you Gift City. Um, hopefully. Just remember, this is the internet, and I don't moderate this content. So if anything comes up that shouldn't, I'll do my best. Um, where is my mouse going? OK, cool. OK. Cool. OK, so this is GIF City. Uh, GIF City, as you can tell, is full screen GIFs. Cool. Uh, it has basically no features. Uh, except for this guy up here. Where are we? Okay. So what GiveCity does is we take the name of a Tumblr and we hit the Tumblr API and we just look for GIFs. Pretty great, right? Um, we have um, only a couple of features. We have the X button, which if a GIF comes up that's a little bit rude for the office, it is Tumblr after all, uh, you hit X. And it will remove that GIF and never, ever show it again, which is kind of great. Uh, and the GIFs are random. This is one of my favorite tumblers called Classics. Uh, but in the source, we actually, you know, in the source, we actually keep a list of a couple of our favorite tumblers in here. Uh, let's see. Let's find some good ones. We got some Adventure Time fans here. No? Want just right? Come on. <laughs> You're lying to me. Adventure time is the best. OK. Uh, and so what's happening here is it's hitting the Tumblr API uh, for both the Classics Tumblr blog and the Adventure Time GIFs blog. Uh, it's found that many GIFs, and it just keeps traversing through the API and trying to download more and more and more GIFs. Uh, as you'll notice, uh, the URL bar updates. Uh, and the query string shows the tumblers that we, we actually have in there. So if you wanted to, you could actually uh, edit the URL. Oh my god, where's my mouse? There it is. You can actually go and edit the URL. You just put anything in there. And it goes and downloads them. It's pretty great. Anything else? No. OK. We set a couple of rules for the for a GIF city. Uh, we weren't allowed to use any JavaScript libraries. Uh, we weren't allowed to use any JavaScript to do the like little uh, pop down thing. For that, we're using the CSS target selector because why would we use JavaScript? Because we're CSS badasses, of course. Uh, and we didn't want to use libraries because we just wanted to do fun and dumb JavaScript. Uh, you know, smash an API and put your API key in the source code. Of course, that's going to be amazing. Um, we focused on fun, and so. A couple of things happened. Like we were doing this in our office and drinking beer and hanging out. And it was pretty great. And when somebody else would come in the office, we would just start like putting Gift City on and showing them gifts and playing music and you know just inviting people into our office to hang out. And we kept going. Uh, let's see. Okay, cool. We kept going, and we thought we were really cool. We started going to hack events and camp JSs and. Stuff like that. And there was one point where we, uh, at a New Year's Eve party, we were projecting GIFs 40, uh, 40 foot high onto a factory building across from the rooftop that we were on, which we thought was pretty cool. Kind of dorks, I guess. Uh, we uh, took a projector to a camp and dragged out a cable that was 
uh, 50 meters long a power cable and started projecting onto trees. And it didn't really end there. For, for like Tim and Josh and myself, it ended there. We, we were done. But Glenn wasn't quite done. Glenn kept hacking. We kept, as I said, going to parties and playing stuff and hanging out. And Glenn was like, you know what would be really cool if the GIFs were synced to music? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could like hook it up to a turntable and like have an analog control for the GIFs so we could scratch it backwards and forwards? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could like put the GIFs in 3D and shoot pixels of GIFs at the camera? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could like just have like GIFs decoded in the browser? Wouldn't it be great? Like it just kept going. And we humored him for a little while, but to a point we were like, Glenn, I, we need to work. Just please leave us alone. And Glenn kept just writing code, more code and more code and more code. He was experimenting a lot, doing weird stuff, and he was somebody who had never written JavaScript before. Not much, anyway, little bits. Glenn went on and he wrote something called XGIF, uh, which is a web component that actually uh, implements a tag in the browser called XGIF. Uh, it has only a couple of options. You can set uh, a GIF to loop, you can set its playback speed, uh, and you can do some other interesting things. He made it as a, as a web component. He experimented with doing it in React and Angular and using basically every library around to try and go on this pursuit of learning web components, learning audio APIs, learning how to break down a GIF, learning how to, I don't know what his obsession is, but he, I think uh, his business card, what did it say? No, so if you, <laughs> If you don't know how to decode a GIF in a browser, I think he calls you a GIF enthusiast, but he's a GIF pro. Anyway, I'm going to show you a little demo of uh, XGIF. Has anyone seen XGIF before? Bunch of folks? Cool? OK, so XGIF uh, takes a GIF. You add a tag to your browser, just like you would an image. You say, here's the source of the GIF, and it plays it, just like an image. Then some other cool stuff happens. You can actually uh, change the playback of the GIF. So you can do this ping pong effect. And then you can e even do other stuff like uh, how many times do you want the GIF to play through? Just once, then pause. And that, that's all implemented uh, as attributes on the, on the element. It's pretty cool. You can set the speed. Mm. You can set speed so you can say like, oh hey, be really fast, be like crazy, stupid fast, or just be like one frame a second kind of thing. Then he started working on beats per minute. And he figured out you could actually sync some audio. So Glenn is super rad. Uh, he's, he's my buddy. He's the CSS comp guy as well. Uh, you should definitely say hi to him because I'm using his demos and I'm kind of getting played music and look cool, but he, he's cooler than I am. But I think what's really interesting here is that XGIF wouldn't have happened if we didn't get drunk in the office and just start hacking with GIFs. And this took Glenn on a trip where he started giving conference talks at Cascadia JS in Portland, at uh, JSConf in Melbourne, at JSConf in Berlin. And his conference schedule continues to get booked beyond today because of work like XGIF. So I want to set you a challenge. GIF City started as a one hour challenge and it led to hours and hours of learning and super amounts of fun. So I want all of you to go ahead and, and just do a dumb thing. Whatever the dumbest thing is that you can come up with that you think you can do in an hour, just try and do it. 
fact is, if it's fun and you actually achieve something in an hour, you'll probably work on it for the entire weekend, but that's fine. I had another dumb project. Uh, on Fridays, we have a thing that we, we run at our office called Jelly. Jelly is casual co-working. Uh, we have a you know, reasonably sized office and we just like to invite our friends to come in and kind of work and just be around us and go for lunch and have drinks together at the end of the day. One particular Jelly day, I didn't feel like doing actual real work. And I had never used Bower, so of course I should do something with Bower, right? Never used it. Uh, I'd also never ever written any Python. Still have no idea what I'm doing. And I didn't even use Sublime Text either. So of course, what am I going to do in an hour? I'm going to write a Sublime Text plugin in Python that uses Bower so you can install Bower packages. Because, I don't know, that's the most sensible thing that I could do. In an hour, I pulled something together that kind of worked by reading other people's source code. And over the weekend, I tidied it up and released it. The last time I checked, this plugin had had over 10,000 uh, installs. And uh, a lot of people actually use it. I, I don't use it. So if you've got some spare bandwidth and you want to fix the issues, uh, have a look at the issue tracker on there. But what was really interesting here is that after uh, I worked on this, I ended up joining the Bower team, uh, which was a totally unexpected result. I didn't ever use Bower before this point of like writing this dumb thing in Python that I had no idea what I was doing and using an editor that I didn't use either. Which kind of gets me to uh, a point about open source. How many people write plus ones on issues? Yeah, you're all jerks. Um, I think, uh, I, I really hate this about open source. I really hate this like, hey, please go and spend all of your time and do this for me. Because it really doesn't give anyone anything. And I want to let you in on a little secret about open source. You can actually do open source without doing anything. This is my strategy. Watch, listen, learn, and just help where you can. And the reason I say this was because of a particular uh, circumstance that kind of came towards me. There's the old saying of you don't know what you don't know. Or in my case, I would say you don't know what you don't know until it literally falls out of your head. For a little while, I was uh, not a contributor, not, hadn't written any code, uh, the match media polyfill. I was interested in the match media polyfill and I just started sort of trolling around the issue tracker and following it and sort of looking at how it worked. It was a really simple little polyfill and I thought it was cool. And about hmm, two years ago, an issue came in that said that we should remove this code. There was a completely new PR that rewrote all of this and it was a huge PR. It basically rewrote the entire library. And I spent hours reviewing it. Remember, I was not a contributor to the, to the open source project. And I just reviewed this and the code was really good and so we talked about a couple of little style things that we wanted to fix before we accepted it into the project. But it got in and months went on. One day, I was in my team chat uh, with one of my clients and Matt said, we've got a production performance issue on mobile. Does anyone know what this crazy minified code that says offset with triple equals 42 means? And I had no idea that I would know this until he pasted it. And as soon as he pasted it, I was like, that's the match media polyfill. Because I reviewed that pull request, you know, months ago. And that's the only thing that I could imagine that has code that's this ridiculous. And because of that, I guess I knew that there was actually a new version of this polyfill which addressed these performance problems. And we upgraded it, the Bower package, and our performance issue disappeared. I know that's a kind of fun story. It doesn't happen every time like that, but sometimes it does. How many of you uh, build things, start building something, maybe work on it for a few hours and never show anyone? Now everyone, come on, everyone does that, right? I know you do, you're lying, you're just late, you're lazy or something. And almost forever, uh, particularly earlier in my career, I would uh, think of an idea and then 10 minutes later I would be 
writing code and my girlfriend would say, are you going to bed anytime soon or are you gonna to continue to be hacking on your laptop? And I would say, shh, I'm working on my laptop. And I would stay there and I would be working past two o'clock in the morning on this dumb thing. Um, and then I would wake up and I'd be bloodshot going to work the next day and basically hating my previous decisions of working on this dumb thing. Um, but for a long time, I, I didn't ship these things. They were half-baked and like, they weren't really thought to the point of like, can I actually release this? And I think dumb experiments like that are useless, especially if you're not gonna commit to actually showing somebody or actually sharing it, even with just one friend, maybe at your, at your work or someone on the internet that you talk to regularly. And for a, a little bit longer after that, I started bringing my friends into my dumb projects. And I, we also found the situation where we'd start arguing about the project before we'd even launched it or shown anyone else. We're arguing about silly things that didn't really matter because nobody else knew this thing existed except for one or two people. So I'm gonna set a challenge for all of you here. The next time that you're gonna build something that you don't think you're gonna ship, I'm killing kittens. That guy too, God, he's so cute. Holy moly. So don't count your days. Make your days count. Work on projects that you think that you'll ship. Work on projects that are fun. Work on projects that are dumb. Don't necessarily do it for money. Celebrate your wins. When you do something cool, enjoy it. Maybe launch something on your birthday, right? So for me, I don't know about you, common birthday is you wake up and you spend time with your partner or your family, and then they say, I have to go to work today. And you say, okay, I'm not working today. And then the house goes quiet and you sit by yourself looking at Twitter. It's pretty boring, isn't it? So instead, I decided to launch something on my birthday this year. For the past year before, I'd been working on an app called Caliber, which is a quality and performance telemetry suite for the web. It runs on Chrome, or it uses Chrome DevTools. Everything that Chrome DevTools can get, Caliber runs. Uh, it runs against your site every day or when you hit the API and it gives you metrics about your site, like how quickly uh, first paint was, uh, what your CSS like quality is like, what your, um, it records videos of every time your site loads so that you can compare them and like look at screenshots of how long it took something to render or maybe you can blame a third party for their ads being slow. So I've been working on this for a long time. If you wanna check it out later, uh, it's calibrapp.com. But I launched it on my birthday. And it was the best birthday ever, because for the next like eight hours, I just watched my phone be like retweeting and people saying, hey, congratulations, you launched something. That's really cool. So I want you guys to do that too. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, by Ben Peart. Ben Peart worked on uh, Supply, uh, which later sold to eBay, which I think he was maybe not so proud of after, because uh, they did nothing with it. They didn't ship it, so I'm gonna kill a kitten for that. He said, as a creative person, you've been given the ability to build things by, from nothing by the way of hard work over long periods of time. Creation is deeply personal and rewarding. And it means that your work should be rewarding as well. And if it's not, then something's wrong, right? We're spending all these hours working on a computer, typing in, staring at this goddamn screen. We should be enjoying that. Our jobs are pretty great. And as a creative person, you need to understand yourself. I don't think you can underestimate the importance of understanding what motivates you as a person and then working on that and self-analyzing and getting better at understanding the way that your brain works. You gotta figure out what makes you tick. You gotta figure out how to ship. And as you do it, you should repeat and you should get better. You should make friends. Kind of hard sometimes. And depression isn't really talked about a lot in our industry. And like I said, you and yourself alone are the master of your own mental state. But you can help your friends and you can help your colleagues. And not to mention minority groups as well. In short, be better than you are. Your career is long. Make it count. Make it enjoyable. And model your career on Work that is not necessarily gonna make you famous or rich, but just work on stuff that makes you happy. Iterate on that, and when you succeed, 
then worry about money. It'll come. Because if you don't, it'll leave you hollow. It'll leave you numb. Sometimes you need to quit. There's been many situations through my career where I've worried about a situation with a client or with, you know, when I worked for companies where I hated every day. I regretted waking up. I regretted going to the office. I regretted having to work with that person that I didn't like, that didn't understand me because I'm special. And then you quit. And it all disappears. Everything can be great. Be ambitious. If I had followed through my career the old adage of if you're not good at something, don't ever give it away for free, I'd have missed out on amazing opportunities to meet people, um, to work on projects, and you know, particularly becoming like sort of friends with my heroes. I've always and believed that sort of going from the gut that I'm doing the thing that is the right thing to do. And there are times where I've strayed away from that path for a pro you know a project or a particular job. Sometimes for money. Working blissfully is really important. And while there are times that you're going to have to suck it up and just do your job, those should be exceptions. So if I had any advice for newcomers to our industry or any creative pursuit, I'd say figure out what's important to you and strive to get there. And don't be afraid to do what people will tell you is stupid. Because if I had done that, I would never have built all these ridiculous things that have actually done more for my career and more for me enjoying working with people and learning from people than I had ever done in my commercial career. If I had just done the commercial thing, I don't know where I'd, what I'd be doing. I probably would have quit by now, completely, honestly. So believe in yourself and trust yourself, and you'll build incredible things. Do work that makes you feel good. Start an event, promote good work, make friends, encourage them. Have a really fucking good time.